Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm glad today uh, to be in this uh, blog about programming languages that are part of the Climate Informatics uh, 2023 Reproducity Challenge. And today we have a, a nice presentation by Rafael, and he's gonna present uh, Julia for Geoscience and Spatial Research. Uh, Rafael is a, an avid uh, contributor in the Julia Geo Organization, and he has a interest in ecology and and kind of or oh, bit oh, uh, data set analysis in in this in this domain. But of course, he's contributing to other domains and he's gonna present that today. He's part of the Center for Microbiology, Evolution and Climate at, Global, at the Global Institute at Copenhagen uh, University. So welcome, uh, Rafael. Please feel free to go your own pace. You, you have 30 minutes. Uh, you can go to your slides and after uh, having this nice demo. So welcome, Rafael. Thanks, Alejandro. Okay, um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about using Julia for geoscience and spatial research. Um, let's get started. So my background is uh, as an ecologist doing uh, spatial modeling and um, spatial ecological simulations, like the one you can see in the background. Um, I started in Julia building this package dynamic grids, which is like a um, high performance simulation engine for ecological models. And that led me into working on geospatial data as well, because we were often using R or other tools for the backend processing and the workflow wasn't great. So over time, we shifted all of that to Julia. Um, and that kind of leads into the question of uh, why would you use Julia for spatial science if you're using R or Python or something else? And um, so in my case, and, and a lot of the examples I use today, the reason is you do spatial modeling already in climate, ecological modeling, hydrological modeling, et cetera. So you use Julia because it's so amazing for writing these kind of models and you get speed orders of magnitude speed up over other languages. Um, otherwise you need high performance in your GIS analysis. Maybe you have huge data sets, um, multiple gigabytes or terabytes that you need to process. Maybe you need visually and interactive to visually and interactively explore your data. And increasingly, Julia is becoming really good for that. Um, and I'll try and demo some of those things today. Um, and last, you need to write new models and tools yourself. And if you need to write anything specific, it's just so much easier doing it in Julia than R because you never have to drop down to C or Fortran um, to write performant code. Okay, uh, also I wanna cover in this talk, why not use Julia, just not to set too high expectations. If you need time-tested tools that have had 10 years of work and huge ecosystem using them, um, Julia is not the place for that. Um, if you need thorough documentation and online learning resources, um, also you may find some issues. Some of my packages have a lot of documentation, some other Julia Geo ones do as well, but some of them don't. Um, because this is a, a slow process to get a list together. Um, and if you never need more performance than you get from R or Python, uh, you may not want to switch to Julia at the moment. Um, Julia is young, package ecosystem is younger. And so some of the features in, um, I'm going to show today were just registered this week. Um, and this is kind of a common thing at the moment. Um, some of those features will definitely have bugs but also some of them are amazing and you can't do them in other languages. So it's kind of, that's that's the trade-off, the choices that you're making. And um, I'll show you a little demo now of, um, this is a um, simulation um, someone just posted recently using our new package, Tyler, actually before it was released. But th this is um, showing all ice melt in Greenland for the last 40 years in this like very interactive, live simulation over the top of maps. And that's really easy to do. That's just like 20 lines of code. Um, so if you need to do that kind of thing, that's when Julia might work for you. Okay. Okay, to talk about geo geospatial tools in Julia, we really need to talk about Julia Geo um, and these organizations generally. So. Julia Geo is a GitHub organization. So we have a GitHub page kind of as the center of um, how we work. Um, 
and it's focused on geospatial tools in Julia. So it's a loose organization of interested developers who've contributed at different times in the last five, six years. Um, and it's open to contributions from anyone else. If you want to update something or add a new package, um, you can talk to any of us. Um, and, and that's pretty easy to do. Um, and just to show you how that might happen, we have a website, Julia Geo, that lists packages um, in the organization and other related things as a kind of hub. Um, there's a Geo channel on Slack. If you need to talk to anyone or ask questions, this is a good place for kind of casual conversation or, or maybe posting cool things that you're doing. It's pretty common to see a lot of uh, fun examples on this thread. We also have a more kind of formal um, permanent um, discussion thread on, um, on the Julia discourse page um, under the geo category. So if you have questions, you can ask there. And in Julia, it's more common to ask questions on discourse than stay on Stack Overflow for whatever historical reasons. Um, it's a bit more um, chatty as well than Stack Overflow. Um, okay. And then we have, yeah, we have a, um, a GitHub page. And this is where you can find all the packages, um, kind of core packages for Julia Geo. Um, we have, you know, all the, the fundamental things like GDAO and that CDF, libgeos, proj. We also have uh, native implementations of Shapefile and um, GeoJSON and some other um, spatial packages. Um, okay. Now I'll, I'll go through some more examples of packages. Um, okay, so Geo interface, um, you may have seen on the last page, this is kind of the glue for the spatial data ecosystem and it's, I can't, don't have a picture for it. It's hard to demonstrate what it is. It's like a, it's a way of connecting all the packages together. Um, and recently we've, we've updated it to a, using a trait space interface, which means that all the packages can interact without having direct dependencies on each other. So you can use objects from any spatial packages in other packages and it kind of just works. Um, some things are still slow or missing and there's still bugs remaining because this has really rolled out in the last year. Um, so this will kind of stabilize over the next six months or year. Um, at the moment, we have sources from libgeos, archgeo, which is the geo wrapper, um, geometry basics, shapefiles, geojson, and other packages um, that, that um, give you objects that uh, work into the geo interface ecosystem. OK, um, this is a little example of how that works. Um, all these packages just define a bunch of functions that, that tell everyone what their objects are and how to get geometries from them. So this is just defined across the ecosystem and makes things just work. Um, you'll see a bit of that later in the demo. Um, my main package is uh, rasters.jl. So this is for the um, raster data side of things. Um, this is a wrapper for ArchGDAO, NC data sets, um, has plots um, out of the box, like the one you can see also for Mackie now. Um, we'll do rasterization and It'll handle much, much larger than memory data sets as well using disk arrays underneath. And I'll show a bit of that in my demo too. Um, now getting to some of the more of the new exciting tools. Um, Mackie um, and Mackie org tools built on Mackie um, are really um, becoming mature at the moment um, and really starting to have interrupt with geospatial packages where um, people from Mackie and Julia Geo are working together a lot these days. Um, and what you can see now is a, a one day old data shader tool that just got released. So you can do like Python style data shader plotting. Um, and there's plans to make this much bigger. So we should be able to do data shading over hundreds of gigabytes um, in future. Um, okay, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, Another a new package is tiler.jl, which is like a um, XYZ tile um, package. And here you can see we're using Tyler with um, Segment Anything, Facebook's new segmenting engine running over the top. And we can do auto segmentation of, of spatial maps. Um, and that will be wrapped. There's a Segment Anything package we've just wrapped, but this will be better wrapped in future as well. Um, 
but this is the kind of thing that's easy. It's very easy to put together these interfaces and tools with Maki. Um, another thing we have for geospatial work is GeoMaki, which makes these amazing uh, projected plots, um, globes, and whatever projections you want for, for raster and um, vector data. Um, okay. Now I'll jump to um, running through some notebooks. Um, Hopefully these work. Oh, yeah. Okay, there we go. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start with just showing some basics, just to kind of show that you can do regular geospatial workflows in Julia. Um, then we'll look at um, working with some vector data. Um, I'll import geo interface in this package geodm for downloading country borders and you can see it's as easy as just uh slow um adding the name of the country and um you can get the border for it and we can see that this is a patch gdal object but it's a geometry and it's a geo interface multi polygon, so it will work pretty much everywhere. So, um, worry about it. Julia has a lot, has pretty good plotting interrupts. So, we have this package plots.jl um, that I'll show, show first before Mackie. Um, um, so, we can plot most geospatial objects. Um, hmm. Seems a little slow with um, Zoom running. Okay, there we go. Um, so things just plot out of the box, just using the plot command. Um, we also have like obvious regular packages like libgeos work in Julia. You'll find they're probably not as well documented as they are in R and Python, but um, you have access to all the functions. So we can run, and what's cool about geo interface is we can just run um, simplify on this GDAL object and it just automatically converts and runs simplify on it. So we can um so you can see now that's a it's a libgeos object. And again, we can plot it, plot the simplified object. Um, other functions like buffering and whatever you need from libgeos work. Um, with a little bit of digging to find the documentation. Now we'll have a look at um, raster data. Um, we have this neat little package raster data sources that lets us download data from the web, like common data sets like BioClim, uh, WorldClim data, just with a one liner like that. And um, we can use them in rasters.jl. Um, here, just make a stack uh, using those layers. Um, we can also just do it directly without that first step and, um, we can plot the whole stack again, just using the same plot stop plot function that just kind of works out of the box. And again, it's kind of slow with, uh, zoom. Yeah. I was hoping these things would be faster the second time, but something is happening with Zoom running, but it's really slow. Okay. Yeah, so we, we get kind of these generic plots out of out of um, rasters for free, sh showing the coordinates and the, the layers pretty easily. Um, you can customize those too if you want. Um, rasters does easy subsetting. You can just specify X and Y coordinates like this, kind of similar to X array. Um, here we've just subset it to um, Madagascar. Plotted it. You can also just make single rasters, of course. Um, here we're going to download a world clean climate layer, and uh, we get a bit of information about it there, um, which plots a little bit funny in Jupiter. Um, but a really important thing to know about raster data in Julia is that rasters are just arrays. 
And this is quite different to R, where you have to use things like as matrix or as array or, or do conversions. Um, maybe you need to in Python, you need to convert to NumPy arrays. Um, in Julia, these are just basic arrays, and they'll work in all Julia packages that accept abstract arrays. So uh, you can do normal array operations on them, and this geospatial metadata just flows through everywhere. So you can see this is just also wrapping an array inside, but um, and we can run regular functions like maximum on it. Um, we don't need to have special functions in the raster package to process raster data. They're just using base functions here you can see um, I can do broadcasting if you guys know what broadcasting is in Julia it's it's just a way of running any function over an array using this dot syntax and you can see I've just used that dot syntax and the result is again a raster um, there's some really cool implications of this is that if you've moved your raster to the GPU that dot syntax will work the same but the broadcast will work on the GPU and it will still be a raster and you can still plot it um, just the same as you could before using that base function. Um, Rasters also interoperates with um, Geo interface. So have a look at. Um, I'm going to rasterize something really big. Well, quite big. We've got a, a gigabyte data set of all the mammal um, distributions in the world, um, terrestrial mammals. Um, just to give you a sense of, of how these things can work in Julia um, and how easy it is to write these algorithms. So I've made this stuff faster in the last few months and um, it's it was quite easy to get this to be about 20 times, 30 times faster than GDAL. Um, so we can see here that, that if you missed it, that was rasterizing the whole gigabyte um, and you can see we've got a raster of the, of all of the shape files to so 12,000 multi-polygons as a, um, as a raster. We can also do things like coverage. So I can take the coverage of all those pixels. So, um, this is doing a hundred sub points for each pixel. Um, and again, this is much slower using when Zoom is running. I guess it's throttling my CPU a little bit, um, which is unfortunate. <laughs> um, yeah, normally this operation takes a lot longer in other languages anyway. But um, yeah, that actually takes five seconds without Zoom running. Or, whatever reason. Um, we can do zonal statistics. Um, so here I'll um, download some climate data, world climb again, make a stack, and um, just make a data frame of the mean temperatures of all of the animals in that mammal data set. So what is the mean climate range that they live in? And um, so that's, an, again, we're taking zonal statistics over a gigabyte and over seven layers of um, a climate data in, a, I think it's a 4,000 by 2,000 grid. Um, and you can see here, um, what do we have? Ovibos moshatus. It's a musk ox that lives in a cold place. So that makes sense with um, that being at the bottom of the list when we've sorted by temperature. Um, yeah, so things like that, if you're using large data sets, um, are really easy in Julia. And, um, I see increasingly ecologists that I work with will still use R a lot of the time, but when they need to process a couple of gigabytes, they'll use rasters.jl or other, um, Julia Geo packages, because you can do things like that much faster, um, sometimes hundreds of times faster, um, just because it's so easy to write the optimizations. Um, okay, um, now I'm uh, going to um, look into a few other things in Julia Geo. Just recently, we have implemented um, across the board conversions between packages. So instead of having to convert types directly, you can just say convert my object, whatever it is, 
to work with Geometry Basics or with LibGeos, ArchGeeda or whatever. Um, it's not completely working everywhere, but mostly this is working now. So you can take that polygon I had before of Japan um, and convert it. It can things are a bit sluggish um okay so now this is um geometry basics doesn't work with plots.jl like i was the plots that i was doing before it's more it's integrated in the mackie ecosystem and mackie is this new plotting library um it's basically a game engine um but um i'll, I'll use gl mackie which is the um open gl back end for it there's also cairo mackie which would do publication quality plots but today we want to do fast visualizations and um I'll, I'll plot this um it's also taking a little bit of time to load this is another thing with Julia especially today because of the zoom working but um sometimes running things the first times is very slow because of all the compilation done to make it run fast so you often wait a little bit for the first time and then after that the things are nearly instant um and that's kind of the trade-off that we pay for having high performance over larger data sets is that small things are slow um but this Mackie you can see um it's really polished and has these amazing properties um compared to just using plots that we can just zoom and interact with um move, move the um plot around um and we can also layer plots over the top of each other. So here I've just got one, but we can plot multiple things into this axis. And I'll start, I'll demonstrate how useful that is for geospatial workflows um, in the next couple of examples. Um, we'll have a look at using Tyler. Tyler is just like a, an add-on to Mackie that uses Mackie to plot tiles like uh, Google. Google satellite tiles or open street maps. Um, and tile providers is our Julia Geo package to, to wrap all these providers and, and give you all, all the available tile providers on the web. Also works in Leaflet. Um, okay, so I'll get the extent from that um, map of Japan, and we can use that to trigger a new Mackie plot of Japan. I mean, Tyler plot of Japan. And you can see now it's really fast. Um, we can zoom in. It's basically working like Google Maps. You can also, um, of course, plot um, the plot I just made before over the top. The problem being that that Tyler is in Web Makeda. And the plot is in lat long, so we have to um, convert it. To do this, I'm going to use a completely new package, um, Geometry Ops, which is not actually registered yet, um, but uh, we like to live on the edge. Um, the reason to use this instead of using Proge directly is I can do it with one line of code rather than manually converting all of the objects um, between projections. Um, so now I can convert. That map of Japan to Web Makeda. And that should come up. Hmm. Okay, there we go. So we can just plot that over the top of Tyler. And essentially, you can do this with anything. You can do this with rasters and geospatial data and just keep stacking stuff. Um, it's a lot like leaflet um, you can use in R, except it's much faster because it's on your browser, on the, your desktop and using OpenGL. Um, and you can run simulations as layers in this over the top of Tyler as well, and it is surprisingly performant. Um, so, yeah, and we can just keep extending this. It's a, a toolkit for, for making these kind of interfaces. Um,
I'm going to show off this package that I've just uh, registered called Mackie Draw. It's pretty simple at the moment, but the idea is to um, draw and edit geometries and uh, rasters over the top of Mackie so that we can we can edit feature collections and we can work on spatial data manually, kind of like you would do in, in QGIS or ArcGIS, um, just as a Mackie plugin. Okay, so I need to make a new Mackie window. I'm going to get some hurricane data. Um, this is um, using the NOAA's um, complete hurricane data set for all the hurricane observations in history, like the last 200 years. I think it's about it's about a million observations or 800,000 or something. Um, again, we need to project these into um, Web Mercator and um, do some data frame operations. Um, and then we can, again, plot this over the top of Mackey um, as a layer. And you can see now it's all compiled. This is plotting pretty quickly. Um, and amazingly, we can just zoom around and look at all these million points really with really no optimization. This is just doing it out of the box. I can also edit any of these points. Um, it's quite surprising. That's also very little code has gone into doing that. And probably you'll find better scientific uses for this, but we can say, look at um, what uh, hurricanes ever got to London given the um, <laughs> side of these, the, the uh, talks that I'm doing. Um, and it's not named, so we can, we can we could call it the um, Turing, Hurricane Turing. I don't think there ever, ever was one of those. And we can make sure that it actually hits London. Yeah, so also not so friendly with zoom running but um yeah and you can see how you can edit you, you can edit any kind of spatial data with this um you can edit polygons and lines as well um and you can you can enter polygons and lines or you can combine this an application i'm working on these days is combining it with a segment anything so you can do segment auto segmentation um using facebook se segment anything and then do some minor edits if you need to where it gets things wrong. Um, so you can use it for rapid, just click-based segmentation of um, satellite data or any, any other kind of images. Um, I, I do it often for old maps. Um, got a bunch of tools for that coming, but they're not ready to show today. Um, okay. All these things, uh, another kind of interrupt we have is called uh, tables.jl. So all of these objects are tables compatible. So we can just turn that canvas that I was editing into a data frame or save it directly to a CSV or as a GeoJSON file. Um, it will find the geometry column in that. Um, and the edits that I've made in the interface will be in here. Um, so it's really easy to, to string all these things together into a workflow. I can also just with a one liner, I can rasterize the last window of points that I was looking at in Tyler. I can't remember exactly what we were looking at, but um, that will come up. I've just used the extent of Tyler as a rasterization bounds and um, that hurricane data. So we can plot that again. And um, oh, I must have been very zoomed in. So we didn't really get much hurricanes maybe we'll get a specific area and do it again and, um,
Rasterize the wrong bit. Okay. Live demos. Yeah. So now I've rasterized that area I was looking at. So you can use Tyler as an input for getting extents um, to use anywhere else in the spatial ecosystem. Um, and rasters.jl rasters also just plots straight over the top of this, um, seeing it's already in the right projection. Um, I was hoping to give you a demo of um, data shader um, that's really just been released in the last few days in Mackie, but I actually had some problems with the Parquet files, um, nothing to do with Mackie. So I'll just manually um, show you what's just been released. Uh, a, a bunch of people have been working on this. Um, um, basically, this is like data shader for Python. At MackieCon a few weeks ago, we had a, a data shader person there, and uh, there's a lot of um, inspiration to build these tools for Julia. So you can um, you can data shade over functions and make these like these strange attractors, or probably the main use case for this talk is uh, data shading over huge point clouds. Um, point data and in future line data, as you can see happening here. Um, um, this example down here is data shading over 2.7 billion points. So that's just happening live on a laptop uh, with no server or, or anything required. Um, and yeah, we, there's, there are plans to make this work over more points and faster. We have some algorithms for doing this a lot faster when it's sorted. But, um, yeah, um, and also doing it for lines and polygons in the future would be great. Um, yeah, um, so go out and try these things. Um, just want to say thanks to um, Everyone else in Julia Geo, Martin Visa, Martin Pronk, ECNNG, and Fabian Gaines, especially for all their Julia Geo work over the years. Um, and also Simon Danish, Julius, um, Angel for their work on Mackie, and to Alex Gardner for that example of the ice plots that I used, um, and all other contributors of Julia Geo, Mackie, Org, and Rasters. Um, okay. Um, that's my talk. Um, ready for questions?